So this is what the work group did, basically. We were assigned a set of certain DSM-4 disorders. So psychotic uh, disorders work group had a set of 23 disorders that were assigned to us, that were part of our purview. Review these disorders, uh, think about what the limitations are, challenges in terms of uh, clinical practice, in terms of applying sets of criteria uh, for, for these disorders, boundaries between different disorders, if you will. Review the scientific literature over the last 20 years, but even prior to that, because useful information has been generated even before that, collect data sets, identify data sets that might be relevant, that might be germane uh, to questions that might emerge, collect them, review them, and then essentially make changes uh, based uh, on the information that you glean from these data sets. Look at, look at criteria, for example. What's the relationship between different disorders? And you'll see some of the changes in DSM-5 that have resulted from this particular review, particularly relevant to disorders uh, that you'll be dealing with tomorrow. Adding disorders, deleting disorders, revising criteria for disorders, and developing uh, field trials. I must have spent over 2,500 hours uh, between uh, 2008 to 2012 on this process. Uh, and actually, it's not, it's not unique to me. This is what almost every member one of those 168 individuals involved in the process must have spent. This is what we did. We spent about 400 hours in either face-to-face -face meetings or teleconferences. Uh, twice a day, uh, two day, uh, twice a year face-to-face -face meetings. 10 such meetings, uh, if you will, over the five-year process. Uh, one to two times per month, we had an hour and a half teleconferences, and we could, have, we could have more if there were specific issues that needed to be uh, addressed. A number of small groups, so this was the entire work group now, a number of small group task-driven interactions were part of this process, and then generating documents. <coughs> so this is why we think these changes should be made. This is our review of the state of the field in schizoaffective disorder, for example. And based on this review, these are, the these are the challenges we have. These are the issues that need to be addressed. And these are the options to address them. And this is why we think this particular change is most relevant or, or best in terms of addressing uh, this particular challenge. And then we had to develop that, review it in our work group, submit it to the task force. And there was a back and forth there. There was a scientific review committee. There was a clinical and public health review committee. There was a forensic review committee. Then, of course, there was the board of trustees that came last. There was the assembly that had to review the process. And prior to that, because there was so much back and forth and because there was disagreement uh, the, between different review groups, there was a summit group that was appointed to kind of resolve any of these differences. With the scientific review co uh, committee, for example, using the catatonia uh, as an example, there were five back and forths with the scientific review committee re requiring re revision, extensive revision, development of new documents because they came up with a whole set of questions. And actually, interestingly, at the end of the day, they did not approve a couple of changes that we recommended. They did come through. They are in DSM-5 because other groups, other review groups felt they were important and the summit group finally signed off on them and then, and one of them, is relevant uh, to uh, the, the group of disorders that we'll be addressing. So these were some of the things that we did, uh, if you will. There was, if there is, there are a couple of things I think we might have been, and this is my perspective, uh, might have been able to do a little better. One of them is working with other work groups. So the work groups were fairly contained. I think there are a number of issues. We did spend time with other work groups across disorders, if you will, but I think that could, that could have been done to a greater extent than it was. But we did have, we did try and set up a process to address that, if you will. And these were the review groups, as I mentioned, the task force, 
the scientific review committee, which really focused on validity, data, validity, data, validity. Uh, clinical and public health committee, which looked at the impact of any changes on clinical practice uh, on public health. The uh, forensic committee, which really focused more than anything else on the clarity of language, because how clearly you state things is of particular relevance with regards to uh, uh, forensic practice. And then I mentioned the summit group, the assembly, the board of trustees. So what are some of the major changes uh, in DSM-5? Biggie at, at a big level, no more multi-axial system. No more axis one, axis two, axis three, axis four, axis five. And I, uh, I know I can see the sadness uh, writ on all your faces uh, as you recognize that no more multi-axial system a, it's not, it's not useful, it's complicated, it's not meaningful, uh, and unnecessary. It de demotes intellectual impairment, uh, personality disorders to a second level, if you will, and they're as important, as relevant as depression or anxiety disorders, if you will. And so this axis one, axis two, axis three distinction doesn't make sense. Axis four, uh, is important, but I'm, I'm not sure the way it, it's, uh, it's available, in, it was available in DSM-3 or DSM-4, was particularly useful. It is important to identify social circumstances, stressors, uh, environmental issues that are relevant in terms of psychopathology, but the Axis 4 did not do a great job. And Axis 5 utilized a lot, but in my mind, terrible, because it mixed psychopathology and function. And exactly what a score of 55 means, there are 20 different ways that one can get a score of 55. So a score really doesn't tell you much, although insurance companies loved uh, the GAF scores, disability, social security administration, used a lot, but really misinformed, if you will. So one big change, no more multi-axial uh, classification. Just one diagnosis, as you have in the rest of medicine. We'll talk a little bit about what happens to axis four and axis five. The overall structure is changed. And one of the biggies that's relevant to our dis your discussion uh, tomorrow is there is no separate section on disorders usually first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, and adolescence. Now those of you who only practice child psychiatry, I'm sure find this a problem because now you're gonna have to go through the entire manual. Earlier, you just had to go through the first chapter. I mean, the first chapter was disorders, uh, you know, usually first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, adolescence, covered everything, and so that's it. You know, you're done with your review of DSM. Uh, an important reason why this was done, because most disorders that you see in adulthood develop in childhood, adolescence. Many of the disorders that you see in childhood, adolescence persist through adulthood, and this separation is unnecessary and again, misinforms, if you will. What is important it is to be cognizant of developmental issues, which are very, very important, and they are emphasized extensively in each chapter, in each section of DSM-5. So this is another big change. And there are 20 sections now, and the way in which they're ordered is, is meaningful. It defines the relationships. The first chapter, for example, is neurodevelopmental disorders. The second chapter is psychotic disorders, including schizophrenia. Well, schizophrenia, there's a significant neurodevelopmental aspect to schizophrenia. There is a certain amount of cognitive impairment, intellectual impairment in schizophrenia. It also tends to develop earlier in life. So because of that reason, that's the second chapter. One of the changes you'll see is there's no mood disorder section. It's been separated into a bipolar disorder section and a depressive disorder section. There are differences. Bipolar disorders are related both to schizophrenia and to depressive disorders. So actually bipolar disorders are the third section placed between section two psychotic disorders including schizophrenia and section four depressive disorders. The point I'm trying to make is the ordering of the different disorders is relevant in terms of describing the relationship between adjacent sets of disorders. And very importantly, the diagnosis is still categorical. It's 
you define you either you have a disorder or you don't have a disorder. You can describe how severe it is. We'll talk a little bit about that with reference to disorders that you're going to be discussing. But dimensional assessments are emphasized in each chapter, differently in each chapter, in each section, but they are significantly emphasized. So in DSM-4, as you read your first chapter and were done, this is what you had. You had disorders usually first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, or adolescence. This was the chapter. And mental retardation was the first uh, sub subsection. Learning disorders, motor skills disorders, communication disorders, pervasive developmental disorders. This is where autism and the other uh, uh, re uh, related diagnoses were. Attention deficit and disruptive behavior disorders were clumped together, if you will. Uh, feeding and eating disorders of infancy or early childhood. Tick disorders, elimination disorders, other disorders of infancy, childhood, or adolescence, and there were four listed under there. So if you look at DSM-4, that's how these disorders were organized in the first chapter uh, in DSM-4. In DSM-5, as I mentioned, there's a restructuring. A, there is no se such uh, section on disorders first diagnosed in infancy, childhood, adolescence. There is a neurodevelopmental uh, uh, disorders chapter, that's the first chapter, and which includes many of the disorders uh, that were included uh, in this chapter in DSM-4, but many of the other disorders are moved to other sections because that, that's where they have a better relationship. DSM-5 is organized into three sections. DSM-4 was also in some ways organized in three sections, except that section three was called the appendix. That is less important. I mean, I don't know how many of us really went through or paid attention to what was in the appendix. We usually, section two was where we ended uh, our uh, reading of DSM-4. Now, DSM-5 has sections one to three and an appendix. Section three, includes diagnoses or disorders that are not sufficiently well developed or characterized to be in the main body in section two and yet have a fair body of evidence to suggest that they're worthy of research attention. You have a specific set of criteria and perhaps clinical pra practitioners should also be cognizant of them because they might be useful in terms of guiding their assessment of individuals who might meet those categories. Also, dimensional assessments, rating scales, uh, you know, you talk about disability assessment, the HUDA. So there are other measures in Section 3 which, would, which might be very useful for the clinician. And then, of course, there's the appendix. Uh, I mentioned very important normal multi-axial system. All diagnoses, axis 1 to 3, you just diagnose, you know, list of diagnoses, if you will. Uh, psychosocial contextual factors, which was formerly access for, they captured via the V codes. In ICD-10, by the way, uh, the ICD-9, V codes is an ICD-9 uh, terminology. In ICD-10, they they're called Z codes, if you will. In ICD-11, they're going to be called something else. So don't, you know, don't keep up with this. Just something to keep in mind. Or, very importantly, the narrative. You know, when you're formulating a particular case, you can discuss the psychosocial contextual factors of particular relevance. Disability, uh, but actually Axis 5 was not just disability. GAF scores are a measure of psychopathology and functional. And so now, uh, this is the WHO Disability Assessment Scale, HUDAS, uh, if you will, uh, the second version. Uh, is a very good instrument. It's not part of section two, but it's part of section three, if you will. That's the scale that, uh, uh, you know, in DSM-5 review process was found to be particularly useful in terms of describing uh, function, if you will. So I mentioned there are 20 chapters. These are the 20 chapters. And if you look at the ordering of the chapters, you see a relationship between adjacent chapters. First chapter, early adult, uh, early child, I mean early development, neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and we're going to focus on those. Second is schizophrenia spectrum and other psychotic disorders. Bipolar disorder, depressive disorders, which again in turn are closely related to anxiety disorders. 
Acts, uh, the fifth chapter. The anxiety disorders chapter has been separated into three, broken down into three, because these are three distinct kinds of pathologies. Anxiety disorders, trauma and stress are related disorders, and adjustment disorders, PTSD, etc., are part of that chapter. Obsessive, compulsive, and related disorders. So this is the ordering. Now, once you get beyond here, why these disorders are here and not elsewhere, they've got to be somewhere. And they don't belong with the others, and it would be misleading to include them uh, with the others, and that's why they are where they are. So I mentioned a no multi-axial system. Developmental issues have been added to criteria, uh, and, and the rel relevant things included in different chapters. Uh, the, in terms of gender cultural factors relevant to diagnosis, you'll see a significantly greater emphasis, particularly in the text, if you will. That's been substantially revised. Uh, I don't know how many of you keep up with the, the numbers of different disorders, for example. Uh, what's ADHD, for example? What's, you, well, no longer. That's ICD-9. That's ICD-9. So ICD-9, all disorders in ICD-9 were between 290 and 319 were all the psychiatric disorders, if you will. Uh, 317 to 319, for example, being different severities of mental retardation, as it was called then. No longer called that now. But ICD-10, essentially, you have a letter followed by a two-digit number and then some points after that. Don't worry about that. This is complicated enough, if you will. And so that changes. In ICD-11, it's going to be even more complicated.